Today I'm going to be talking about molar pregnancy, which is a range of conditions due to disordered placental proliferation. I'm going to cover some of the terms and definitions first because it's quite confusing. A molar pregnancy is the commonly used term for gestational trophoblastic disease, and that's the real umbrella term for all of these conditions. It can be divided into pre-malignant, such as the partial and complete hydatidiform mole, and then the malignant condition, so gestational trophoblastic neoplasia. And these include invasive mole, choriocarcinoma, placental site trophoblastic tumour, and epithelioid trophoblastic tumours. They're uncommon, affecting around 1 in 700 pregnancies, and they're more common in women uh, from Asian ethnic backgrounds and those that are very young or over 40. Recurrence is increased after experiencing one molar pregnancy at 2%, and after two molar pregnancies up to 20%. And then you do get these familial sporadic clusters associated with a chromosome 19q mutation. The reason we're worried and interested in these are that because they can undergo malignant transformation. It's a rare occurrence, but it can happen in a twin pregnancy where you get one normal pregnancy and a coexisting mole. And the estimate for this is around one in 50 to one in 100,000. And they can even occur after normal pregnancies, such as the placental site tumours. We have a good UK programme cure rate of between 98 and 100%. It's important to identify and manage these pregnancies. So here you have a partial mole. This is where you've had dispermic fertilization of a normal egg. And you can see there two sperm have managed to fertilize the normal egg, resulting in a biparental triploid, which cannot develop normally. For a complete mole, all of the chromosome material comes from the paternal line. So you have an empty egg, an egg missing the genetic information, where either one sperm fertilizes and then duplicates or two sperm fertilize. And again, these cannot go on to develop normal, healthy pregnancies. There are some differences between partial and complete molar pregnancy. So partial molar pregnancy is more common. There may be a fetus which can uh, be abnormal or sometimes just a sac, whereas in a complete mole is absence of fecal material. The risk of needing chemotherapy is also increased for complete molar pregnancies at around 13 to 16%. So how do these women present? Quite often they'll come with irregular vaginal bleeding, about 60% of cases. There may be miscarrying. It may be suspected on ultrasound. It could be an incidental finding from histology that was sent for another reason. They may have persistent bleeding after a normal pregnancy or a positive beta HCG after miscarriage or termination. And sometimes they present with exaggerated pregnancy symptoms or hyperemesis. And this is due to the elevated HCG levels, typically above 100,000 for a complete mole. With investigations, we're able to pick up about 40 to 60% on ultrasound and easier to pick up a complete mole. So with a partial molar pregnancy, there is an abnormal or an absent fetus with an enlarged placenta and cystic spaces. With a complete molar pregnancy, there's just more vesicular appearance, polypoidal mass, and there can be bilateral fecal luteal and cysts on the ovaries. Both of these types of pregnancy will have a high Doppler flow over the placental area, indicating the increased vascularity. So you can see here some complete molar tissue. It's obviously abnormal, very vesicular, and have high colour flow. Also associated with these bilateral fecal luteal and cysts on the ovaries. This was a partial molar pregnancy, uh, which wasn't diagnosed on scan. So the patient underwent medical management. It was thought that this abnormal area here was a hematoma. Unfortunately, after the medical management, uh, she represented with retained products of conception. And you can see here that the colour flow was quite intense, indicating that high vascularity. And this was a partial mole. Moving on to management. The ideal management is surgical with suction curatage, and this is to remove the abnormal tissue and also allows a histological diagnosis. So to get the tissue to the lab, so where the diagnosis can be confirmed. We would usually recommend using ultrasound guidance to reduce the chance of any retained products because you want to get a complete evacuation. 
You can use cervical preparation, such as misoprostol. It's recommended this is only used immediately pre-op rather than a day or so before. And this is to avoid an accidental medical management of miscarriage. The routine use of oxytocic agents should be avoided. So we wouldn't recommend using syntometrin or syntocin on after the surgical management of miscarriage unless the bleeding was severe. And that's because as the uterus contracts, these abnormal cells can be pushed into the maternal circulation and increase the risk of metastasis. Unfortunately, these cases do have an increased risk of hemorrhage, so it's important to have a plan considering the use of tranexamic acid by manual massage to rub up a contraction and stop the bleeding. And even the use of an intrauterine balloon can help apply pressure from within. If there is increased tissue on a subsequent scan, it's usually recommended to avoid the repeat evacuation, although this should be discussed with the regional centre. There is a role in some cases. Of course, if there was life-threatening bleeding, you would need to manage as appropriate by removing the retained tissue. So on to the regional centre. So once you've confirmed it, the patient's then referred on to a regional centre. If it has been suspected pre-op, so on your scan, it's a good practice to discuss this step and then obtain consent from the patient. The registration forms do require quite a lot of detail and it's best to complete it with your patient there so you make sure you've got all the required information. And then you can let them know that the BTHCG levels will be monitored both with blood and urine tests. And what you're hoping for is that that BTHCG will decline and that rate of decline predicts the risk of persistent disease. The three centres in the UK are London, Charing Cross and Sheffield and Dundee. So with follow-up, assuming that they've got declining beta HCG levels, follow-up will be termed complete for a partial mole when you've got two negative levels taken four weeks apart. And for a complete mole, because these are slightly higher risk, you're looking for the, if the HCG normalises within 56 days, you'd consider follow-up complete for six months from evacuation. Whereas if the HCG takes longer than 56 days, you would consider follow-up complete six months from the normalisation of the beta HCG. And it's important to advise women to avoid conception until follow-up is complete because it's an important time to detect any recurrence. So moving on now to um, persistent GTG or GTN. The risk factors are age over 40, a very high starting beta HCG over 100,000, cysts greater than 6 centimetres and a uterine size of more than 20 weeks. In order to stage, imaging is considered, and this can be ultrasound to reassess any uh, pelvic deposits, chest x-ray to look for metastasis, and then CT and MRI to detect more distant mets, such as brain mets. And unfortunately, about 40% of women will have pulmonary metastasis. FIGO scoring system is then used. So if you're scoring in the lower risk group, that's 0 to 6, then methotrexate and folinic acid will be used, which has a great 100% cure rate. And even where the score is more than seven, multi-agent chemotherapy has a 94% cure rate. And this includes women with distant brain and lung mets. Treatments continued until the beta HCG is negative and then for a further six weeks. The main reason that treatment is so successful is that these are really rapidly dividing cells. So they're really chemotherapy sensitive and there are lots of targets for the chemotherapy to work on. So moving on to contraception and future outlook, it's suitable to have any method of contraception following evacuation apart from an intrauterine device or intrauterine system such as the myrena or copper coil. And these can be used but only when the beta HCG is normalised. After a simple molar pregnancy, you should avoid conception until the follow-up is completed as we discussed in the previous slides. For persistent GTG or GTM, you advise to wait a year after the treatment's complete, and this is to detect any early recurrence. Um, it's optimistic, so further pregnancies do occur in 80% of women that have required treatment. However, there is a slight risk of premature menopause where multi-agent chemotherapy is used. So it's really important to uh, warn women about that risk when they're considering their future fertility. And actually, once the beta HG is normalised and the follow-up is complete, use of HRT and fertility drugs, if needed, um, can be used. So in summary, 
Not all are picked up on ultrasound, so the diagnosis on ultrasound will only occur in about 40 to 60 percent. And for that reason, it's important that after any pregnancy loss, a urine pregnancy test should be performed three weeks after that's occurred. And any persistently positive pregnancy test should be investigated thoroughly. Histology is recommended for pregnancy tissues if fetal parts have not been identified. And that's because there may be a risk of a partial mole or indeed a complete mole. Regional registration is required because it's really important to pick up and assess for the risk of persistent or malignant disease. However, even when this is detected, this is highly treatable, highly survivable, and most women are able to retain their fertility. Thank you for listening, and I would really appreciate if you could scan the QR code and provide any feedback to help inform future sessions. Thanks.